all you cool cats and kittens. It's Dr. D coming at you with another lecture on invertebrates. Um, a little change of pace today. Got a little dressed up for this one. And I'm recording it while the sun is out. So I've got some good lighting going on here. Got a little fancy. Oh, and I put on a little bit of um, topical jewelry today. I've got this little ring. My little weird pinky ring. That's a trilobite because we are starting with the bestest phylum today. That's a good phylum on my desktop. But this is the bestest phylum in the whole world. We're starting with the arthropods. So, let's celebrate. Arthropods. Arthropods. Okay, so let's talk about arthropods, my favorite phylum of all. Um, the word arthropod means arthro, which means joint, pod, which means leg. There's more than one million described species of arthropods, but their true diversity might be as high as 10 million. Um, and they represent more than 85% of all animal species on the planet. They are everywhere. Um, in addition to having jointed legs, they also have an exoskeleton. Um, exoskeletons are cool. Um, they even allow you to get as big as this coconut crab, but they do limit, limit your growth. If you are constrained by a skeleton on the outside, you can only grow so big. Um, but they overcome this limit on growth by, um, one, using chitin, which can is a material that can serve as a spring and a shock absorber. So what the exoskeleton is made out of allows them to um, withstand a lot of pressure. Um, it allows them to jump around, like these cute jumping spiders. Um, and they can also grow through ecdysis or molting. So they can completely shed this exoskeleton so that they can grow. And that's how they um, get around this limit of growth with an exoskeleton. The defining features of the phylum arthropoda, um, they have lost motile cilia in adult and larval stages. They have an epidermis that secretes um, jointed segments um, and a sclerotized, which just means hardened, chitinous exoskeleton. Uh, so the word sclerotized means hardened. They have, and then thirdly, they have a musculature between joints of the appendages. Uh, so those are the three defining features of phylum arthropoda. A lot of them are also metameric, which we've talked about before. That means they have serial repetition of structures. Um, some of them have many similar segments, like the centipedes and the millipedes we're going to talk about today, uh, and many of them have tegmata. Tegmata are exterior segments that are fused together. So when we get to the insects, um, when we talk about the head and the thorax and the abdomen region, those are examples of tegmata. Those are exterior segments that have been fused together to form those body structures. Um, reiterate again, we are still talking about um, protostomes that are in the group Ecdysozoa. So arthropods are that fifth group, that fifth phylum within the Ecdysozoa. So let's talk a little bit about what Ecdysis is. So um, Ecdysis, this, this process of molting, is controlled by the nervous system in a series of hormones that we're not going to go into a lot of detail on. Um, but these are the, the steps that I want you to know about um, the process of molting. And here's just a few arthropod examples of molting. Um, these are some examples that happened with the uh, marine invertebrates we had for lab. So this is the shed molted exoskeleton of our portly spider crab, Mr. Krabs. This is a different species of spider crab molting its exoskeleton. This is the teeny weeny tiny exoskeleton that uh, Mr. Krabs Jr. just shed two days ago. And then this is the shed exoskeleton of Shelly, our um, uh, horseshoe crab. May she rest in peace because Mr. Krabs ate her right after she molted. Anyway, these are some examples y'all are familiar with. And then here's a few. This is a scorpion that's going through ecdysis. This is a cicada. 
And this is a different species of spider crab um, that's molting. So the first step is apolysis. This is the separation of the old exoskeleton from the epidermis. Then they secrete um, a molting fluid that's not yet active through the epidermis. Then they produce a layer of cuticle for the new exoskeleton. Then while they're bathed in that molting fluid, then they activate it with a series of hormones. They digest and absorb the old endocuticle. The epidermis secretes a new protocuticle. And then through ecdysis, they shed the old um, exo and epicuticle. So what's being shed here is the old exo and epicuticle. Then while the new cuticle is still soft, this is when they can grow. So as you, so what I saw in Mr. Krabs when he molted and Mr. Krabs Jr. when it molted was that they, they, right after they finish molting, they look the same size. But before that new cuticle sclerotizes and hardens, that's the period in which they have time to grow. And so over the process of a few minutes and a few hours, that's when they will grow in size. So, and then after they've grown in size, they have to do all that growing before they have the tanning, which is the sclerotization of the new exocuticle. Once that new exocuticle hardens, they can't grow anymore. And if they need to grow more, they have to shed their exoskeleton again. Um, and these are the steps of molting that I got from this website here. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, some general arthropod features of their circulatory system and their reproduction. They have an open circulatory system that connects to a variety of respiratory structures in each arthropod group. In a lot of groups, you're going to hear the words trachea and spiracles. Those are some, some terms I'd like you to know and understand. We're going to talk about those later. Most of uh, the arthropods are sexual. Uh, they reproduce via sexual reproduction, and they are uh, gonochoristic or dioecious, where they have separate sexes in different animals. And um, they all have internal fertilization. They may, the males may deposit a sperm packet that's external, and then the females pick that up, but the fertilization happens internally. And there are different variations on this internal fertilization that we'll cover. Within the phylum Arthropoda, we are going to cover five subphyla. We're going to talk about trilobites, which are extinct. We're going to talk about the Chelicerata. And then we're also going to talk about the Myriapoda, the Hexapoda, and the Crustacea. This phylogeny that I've got here is the, the most current phylogeny that we have for the phylum Arthropoda. Uh, this is from a paper that was published in 2019. Uh, so this is our most current understanding. And what you can see from this phylogeny here is that, uh, well, trilobites aren't in it because they're extinct and this was a genetic study. <laughs> the Chelicerata is still a, a group here. Um, but what you can see is that the Myriapoda, the Hexapoda, and the Crustacea now belong within a single subphylum called the Mandibulata. But for the purposes of this class, we're going to go with the classifications that are in your textbook. So we're going to go with these five subphyla. But I do want you to know that the Myriapoda, the Hexapoda, and the Crustacea are now referred to as the Mandibulata. So let's talk about trilobites, the little cutie I have on my little pinky ring. Um, all members of this group are extinct, um, but they were very diverse and common in the fossil record. Tri means three. Lobita is lobed, so they have three lobes. One, two, three. Um, and all of these three body regions, they run laterally on the body rather than anterior to posterior, which is um, a distinct feature of this group. So the defining characteristic of trilobita, trilobo, trilobita are these anterior posterior furrows that you see here that give them their name. They're dorsoventrally flattened. Um, which might be one reason why they are so common in the fossil record. And there are three recognizable regions um, from anterior to posterior. They have um, a cephalon that's located here. They have a thorax that's here. And then they have a tail segment called a pygidium. The cephalon has a set of paired antennae. It has a mouth. Um, that's not labeled here as a mouth um, with a labrum, which is like a, a upper lip covering over the mouth. And then they have a pair of compound eyes. 
Each segment posterior to the cephalon bears um, a pair of biramus, which means two branched appendages. Um, and it looks like one of these segments of these biramus appendages might have been involved in uh, gas exchange while the other was involved in locomotion. They were uh, very, very common in the Cambrian period. Um, they were likely benthic marine. Most of them are about 50 centimeters long. Um, but nearly all vanished during the mass extinction event um, in the Permo-Triassic, which was about 220 million years ago. So that's trilobites. Here's some fun information. Um, I'm not sure I've talked about this in class before we moved online, um, but when I was at University of Illinois, I helped organize the Insect Fear Film Festival every year that uh, May Berenbaum created. It's been going on, it just had its 37th year. Um, and one of the themes while I was a grad student was prehistoric insects um, with this really great logo designed by Rob Mitchell, who's now um, a professor in Wisconsin. Um, and we watched this movie called Ice Crawlers, uh, where some scientists accidentally thaw a prehistoric trilobite uh, out and it attacks and eats everyone in the research facility. So if you like really bad horror movies or really campy horror movies, because I really enjoyed it, so it's not that bad. If you like really campy horror movies, you should check this one out. The, the uh, monster in it is a trilobite. Okay, so let's move on to the myriapods. Um, one important note I want to make, so make sure, as always, that you pull up your learning goals um, and you fill out your study guide while you're watching this video. Um, one thing I want you to be able to do on our next exam is I want you to be able to identify any of the groups we talk about on this phylum here that I've created for the phylum Arthropoda or on that phylum we've been referring to all semester for um, the entire kingdom Animalia. And when I say groups, I'm not talking about these ones that are very clearly labeled. I mean the subgroups that are within it. So like on example of for the kingdom Animalia phylogeny, be able to indicate the node that represents um, egg dysozoa. That's obviously not it because this is just arthropods. But um, be able to identify that. On this phylogeny, I'd want you to be able to identify the node that represents the myriapods. That's this node here. Um, so I just wanted to make that important note. This is a phylogeny. This is a summary phylogeny that I constructed from that um, bigger phylogeny that I showed you previously. This is just summarizing the consensus of that phylogeny into the groups we're actually going to talk about in class. Um, and right now we're going to talk about the chilopods and the diplopods in the myriapod group. So let's talk about myriapods. These are things that you should be familiar with. They're centipedes and millipedes. This is a house centipede. These are some super cute millipedes. This is a scolopendra centipede. These guys are huge and cool. Um, this group is distinct uh, from the trilobites that we just talked about. The trilobites are biramus. This group is uniramus. They have single branched appendages. Um, they also have a, their circulatory system is open like the rest of the arthropods. And they have respiratory trachea that attach to spiracles on the outside of the body. We've talked about this before in um, the onychophorans, where they have these holes that are uh, facilitating gas exchange directly with the environment. Those holes connect, usually there's a membrane over them, so it's not just an open hole. Those holes with a the membrane then connect to a tracheal system that functions like a lung in these animals. And that tracheal system connects directly to their open circulatory system so they can have gas exchange with their blood. You're gonna hear these words again um, throughout our discussions of uh, the arthropods. Most of them do not have compound eyes. Um, and with the exception of some desert species of centipedes and millipedes, the cuticle is not very thick and hardened and not well developed. So let's talk first about centipedes. These guys are really cool and really scary at the same time. Um, most, all of them are terrestrial predators. Um, they're about four millimeters to about 30 centimeters in length. Um, they are also dorsoventrally flattened um, and they have a homonomous unfused trunk segments that each bear one pair of legs. So that's the main feature of this group when you're trying to tell centipedes from millipedes is they only have one pair of legs per segment. That's very obvious in these pictures here. And on this diagram uh, 
from your textbook. Uh, on the first segment, they have a pair of antennae. You can see that here. Um, they also have um, some mouth parts, and then they have what are called prehensors or forcipules. That's what you see here, these dangerous looking things, because they are dangerous. Uh, these are claws that are capable of injecting poison into their prey um, or to a predator if they're attacked. So you can see the jaws here, and then there's a poison gland located within them. So they're kind of like a syringe. The last segment of the body usually doesn't have walking legs, but it can have um, modified appendages that can help in defense. Um, this species here, this is a fan-tailed centipede. Um, they have enlarged tibia and tarsi on this last pair of their legs, and they can um, kind of wave these terminal segments around and stridulate them um, to uh, draw attention of any predators, and then um, that lets them escape. So it kind of distracts. So they kind of wave it around and distract the predator while they try to escape is what I think what scientists think they use these terminal appendages for. They, a lot of them to have um, uh, courtship behaviors where um, they will dance or present a gift to the females um, in that courtship display. In this group, I'm not entirely sure what strategy is more common. You'll see a lot of different courtship displays in arthropods in general. They have uh, external fertilization. So, well, it's it's not technically external. So what they'll do is the males will deposit a spermatophore on the ground, and then the female picks up that package with her genital opening for internal fertilization. So actually, scratch that, it's an external deposit of a spermatophore that the female picks up for internal fertilization. And quite a few of them are really good parents. These are two um, centipedes displaying parental behavior. So they, they protect and care for their eggs and for the juveniles um, in the early stages. And I just included these because I thought they were pretty. And that one looks like it has a mustache. Uh, another fun thing about centipedes is the, also while I was a grad student, the next year the theme for the film festival was centipedes, um, even though they're not insects. Um, this is another design by Rob Mitchell for the same film festival. This was so, um, this was my very first Insect Fear Film Festival that I worked. That's a scorpion, which isn't a chillipod, but uh, is part of the petting zoo. So this is me, baby me, about 11 years ago at my very first Insect Fear Film Festival. And we showed this really great Japanese movie called Centipede Horror from 1982, um, where a wizard curses a lady uh, and centipedes are involved. I won't spoil it for you. Now let's talk about the real cuties. Let's talk about diplopods. These are the millipedes. Um, millipedes are terrestrial deposit feeding burrowers, so they are really important um, for soil, soil ecology and the ecosystems that they live in. Um, and they have this um, calcified cuticle on their trunk segment that you can kind of see here that's called the column, and they'll tuck their head under and they'll push into the sediment with this shield of calcified cuticles. So they kind of use it like a little bulldozer when they're burrowing into the sediment. Um, the cuticular rings of millipedes tend to be a little more rigid than centipedes because they do have this calcification in them. These guys are round, not flat. So that's one way to tell a, a millipede from a centipede is that they're round instead of being dorsoventrally flattened. Um, and there are about 10,000 described species of them. Now, even though millipedes get their name because it sounds like they have a thousand legs, at max they have about 700, at most they have about 100, or um, most, sorry, max legs about 700, most have about 100 legs. Um, and their name comes from this diplo segment that their legs are on. So each trunk, trunk segment that you can see here is a diplo segment. That's two segments that are fused together in development, and so that's why they have two pairs of legs on them. So centipedes have one pair of legs per segment. Diplopods, millipedes have two pairs of legs per segment. Um, and each of these diplo segments, in addition to having two pairs of uniramus appendages, has two pairs of spiracles, 
that we talked about earlier for gas exchange and two ventral ganglia. So that's a single segment that's been fused into two and that's why they have two legs per segment. On their head, they have a pair of uniramus antennae, they have a pair of mandibles, and then they also have maxilla and a labrum. It's kind of like a, over, a lip covering over their um, mandibles. And then after the head are three unfused haplosegments, and then the rest of the body is uh, diplosegments that you can see here in this diagram. Um, until you get to this terminal anal segment that has no appendages at all. Um, this group has uh, ventral repugnatorial glands, um, and some these secrete uh, toxic chemicals for defense, and very commonly, uh, a very common defense mechanism used by millipedes is hydrogen cyanide, um, which is why they might smell a little bit like almonds if you pick them up. So if you're petting a millipede at like a pet petting zoo, make sure you always wash your hands after you touch them. Most of them just have um, ocelli or simple eyes, as illustrated here. So that's a little bit on the morphology and anatomy. Um, in terms of reproduction, um, some do um, the spermatophore package delivery with external mating and then internal fertilization, um, but some of them will copulate for internal fertilization as well. This is um, an article that just came out in February of this year um, on studying um, reproductive behaviors in millipedes. And some of them UV fluoresce. So I've told you guys about these Atlas Obscura trips that I led last summer. Uh, one of the activities that we did at night was we used some UV lights to hunt for millipedes and we actually found them. All we had to do was go like right off our balconies in the Sierra National Park and find these glowing millipedes. It was really, really cool to hunt around it in like complete darkness and then shine your light and see these little tiny cuties glowing in the dark. So this is me shining a regular flashlight and then shining a UV light to show that they fluoresce. And then some of them even bioluminesce. Um, so this is some uh, recent news, uh, not within the last year or so, um, of these bioluminescent millipedes that were found in uh, Sierra National Park in California. Um, this is them, so they're not UVing, UV fluorescing, which like when they, a UV light is shown at them, the, they fluoresce. These are ones that just glow in the dark. You don't need that UV light to activate their fluorescent, their, their glow. They just bioluminesce, which is really, really cool. Um, and if you are interested at all in millipedes, you should definitely follow these two accounts here. This is the, the millipede lab that Paul Merrick runs at Virginia Tech. They're doing the coolest research on millipedes. They're the ones that found those bioluminescent millipedes in the Sierra National Park. And then this is an account that's run by um, Derek Hennen that's in the Merrick lab and it has tons and tons of cute pictures of millipedes. So you should definitely check them out on Twitter. Um, and that's it. That's all I got for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you can. I convinced you that millipedes are cute. Uh, we'll keep talking about arthropods next time. Stay tuned. Bye.